So a bit of a background uh, and to reiterate um, what was kind of discussed yesterday. Um, the hip was thought to be an inherently, is, is and was thought to be an inherently stable joint um, in all in label pairs or watershed lesions. And then most of this was attributed to FII and as Dr. Dome said yesterday, some of these findings didn't didn't fit and don't fit when you're talking to patients. Um, so um, hip instability is real, uh, but it's very different than uh, the shoulder, than shoulder instability. Uh, in the shoulder, it's more of a dislocation, uh, frank dislocations that are traumatic and uh, so acquired type uh, problems. Whereas in the hip, it's a more of a micro instability problem, um, chronic in nature and um, sometimes related to congenital problems with uh, either ligaments or bony uh, architecture. So here's a study, this is not, a, not the greatest study um, in regards to its uh, methods, but they did put, uh, I guess, ballerinas in MRI machines <coughs> during the splits, and they showed that the, uh, uh, the promessa tubular uh, joint uh, sublux 2.05 millimeters. So um, the other problems with this, uh, we won't get in that study, but um, so factors and stability. Uh, there's static factors and dynamic factors. Um, statically, you have the acetabulum and its depth, shape, and version. On the femoral side, you have version uh, and varus and valgus. On the cap, you have the capsule, the labrum, and the ligament of teres, which we'll hear about after this. And then uh, dynamically, the pelvic tilt, leg position, neuromuscular control, and cognitive factors. So all these things play a role in, in the hip stability. So real briefly, the, as we mentioned yesterday, 27 muscles across the hip. Um, emphasizing their role for PT and rehab uh, around hip arthroscopy, uh, but also uh, can make uh, have a significant factor in uh, hip stability. So we uh, have seen a lot of this stuff before, but just to, because it's relevant to this talk, uh, the labrum uh, increases acetabular surface area by 22% and the volume by 33% and uh, keeps the femoral head centered. Uh, without the labrum, the, the femoral head will just displace it laterally. Uh, the other static, another static factor, the iliofemoral ligament, um, issue of femoral and pubal femoral to a smaller degree, but uh, primarily we're talking about an anterior instability, so the iliofemoral ligament is of uh, vital importance. Um, several, couple papers have talked about uh, kind of two bands uh, of the iliofemoral ligament, although arthroscopically you can't quite see that, it all looks like just one big, big band. So uh, Hal Martin had uh, done a study where he uh, cut the uh, medial limb and then the lateral limb, and showed an increase in external rotation uh, at all these degrees of uh, hip flexion. So at the pub, uh, the, you can see there the, if I can get back, the pubal uh, uh, femoral and ischial femoral ligaments didn't have much uh, contribution. So uh, another study by Meyer <coughs> and the Philippines group, uh, they looked at uh, <coughs> uh, label tears and ligament with uh, Tears, or ligament tears, and, and then looking at anterior posterior translation with ligament tear, there's a significant change. Um, and then when they repaired the labrum, it went down, ligament went down, but when both were repaired, it uh, decreased. And looking at that in uh, external rotation with the ligament tear, this was at neutral flexion, um, there was a significant increase in external rotation, and then with the repair, it went back down. So it kind of uh, Similar things, so basically the effects of the capsulotomy are that you lose the restraint to anterior translation as well as external rotation. Um, and label repair only restores it to normal mechanics when you're accompanied by a capsular closure. So diagnosis of uh, hip instability, it's often not a traumatic event as in the shoulder. Uh, pain is typically anterior, but they can certainly have a pretty uh, broad distribution of pain, um, probably from a muscular compensation. Uh, their activities are generally super, physiolog super physiologic, where they're dancers, ballerinas, cheerleaders, uh, even might be water polo players. Um, and they get some soreness with prolonged activity. Otherwise, it's kind of a similar presentation than, than FAR, so it's a little bit, um, a little bit more difficult. These are kind of more specific things that I've noticed. So uh, when assessing them, you um, if you have a young female and you can't quite see much on the radiographic. You always want to test their ligament dyslaxity. She's made the habit of doing that in every patient you examine, but um, a quick way is just to have them bend out their elbows, even when you have them supine, you just have them put it out there and see what, see what they're doing before you pick up their hip to, to flex it up. 
you know, bend their knees back. Just a, a quick uh, look to see if their ligaments are lax. Um, so on physical exam specific maneuvers, you can do the supine apprehension test. This is Dr. Jones doing the demonstrating these. Uh, the anterior instability test. He's just trying to uh, uh, put a force to the end of the femoral head anteriorly. Um, this is how I like to do it um, in the lateral position with my hand on the girded toe canner. So I'm pulling, I'm pushing with my left hand uh, anteriorly and I'm pulling back with my uh, right hand to kind of provide that uh, lever moment. And then I'm externally rotating also with the right hand. So another test that's been talked about, I don't have a picture right now, but uh, the dial test uh, has been advocated quite a bit. Uh, this is in the supine position. The examiner internally rotates and then, and then releases the legs. Feet flop out, and if one flight side goes out greater than 45 degrees, that's supposed to be positive um, in the lax mechanical endpoint. So, with this test, as well as almost any physical exam test in the hip, uh, these are not validated. So, it's kind of uh, putting it all together to make sure you can't hinge, hang your head on any of these. So, radiographically, uh, we'll get an AP pelvis. I'll just kind of demonstrate here this is a supine AP pelvis, obviously, that's the type of retroversion. Here's a crossover sign. Um, and so there was a question yesterday, standing or supine films, do you get one or both? Um, I get both, uh, that's probably because of my training, but there's another reason. Um, here's the same patient and the standing upright and the crossover sign decreases quite a bit. So I'll, this is how I use, uh, what I use to decide like how much uh, rim uh, trimming I'll do. So I'm not gonna try to eliminate that. I'll probably aim for more or something like that. Um, so a lot of center edge angle, we've already kind of discussed this. Um, uh, normal being about 25 degrees, between 20 and 25 degrees forward line dysplasia and uh, under 15 dysplasia. So um, we, there's another way to look at this. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Dome and Dr. Botzer's uh, uh, study that they performed <coughs> and they looked at. Uh, they basically, they take the tonus angle as well as a lot of center edge angle uh, subtract tonus angle from acetabular inclination to get a number. So there's a 21 minus uh, 3 there. And uh, they looked at this uh, correlating to intraoperative findings and showed that uh, there was a higher um, rate of ligamentum teres tears in patients who had uh, this low stability index where they had a high tonus angle and a low center edge angle. Um, so that uh, brings into question what the role of ligamentum teres is. I'll leave that to Botzer. Similar slides. Um, so other things radiographically, um, anterior undercoverage. So the false profile will uh, evaluate that the best. Uh, just saw a patient the other day with um, very good normal outer center, center edge angle, but uh, anterior center edge angle about five degrees, and had a lot of uh, instability type uh, symptoms. Um, but so that would have been missed uh, without uh, getting a false profile. Uh, so I just like to show this uh, to emphasize the importance of pulse profile. This is a guy right side of the hip pain. Uh, this is out of Dome's clinic actually, and uh, somebody might say, "Well, he's got something on the edge there. Maybe he's got a rim fracture. He doesn't have a little forward line. It's not some dysplasia. But he's a 50 year old man. Um, so you might think you could get it better with the hip scope. But you get the pulse profile, and he's got anterior wear. His edge been edge loading for a while. So." Um, so there's kind of two types of instability. We're kind of talking about ligamentous. This is a, so there's a bony instability uh, problem where you have low coverage uh, from the architecture of the acetabulum. Um, and this was kind of defined as a center edge angle of uh, 25 and, and lower. Um, so the treatment for this, um, either one of these problems, um, um, we've kind of, Dr. Jones kind of advocated a uh, ligament, uh, uh, soft tissue solution to a bony problem. Um, with some inherent limitations in that you can't do a capsular plication in a patient with sort of severe dysplasia. So there are limitations. You have to be aware of um, how much is too much dysplasia. So this is essentially an inferior shift of the capsule after the capsulotomy, um, bringing the inferior limb superior. Here's a video demonstration of that. So this has been, the labrum has been uh, Repaired, the capsule has been uh, spared during it, all the intraarticular work. Sutures passed on the proximal limb and then distal limb, slightly uh, more inferior or medial to where the previous stitch was. You can kind of see the obliquity there, the purple kind of like Pass another wire, pass another suture. Aiming for as many sutures as you can, which
see they have several sutures placed covered in an oblique fashion there. And those will get tied. Suture management being very uh, key to this part. It's a very difficult part of the procedure. You're gonna, you've gone somewhat endoscopic at this point, uh, very small space. Um, no, uh, pass all the stitches before tying them because you're closed on your space and you're going to have nowhere to work. So we looked at um, a subgroup of, of patients, the borderline dysplasia patients. Um, there were 22 patients in this group. Uh, they received the capsule plication as, and it fit that, that bony category. Um, they all had improvement in, in all uh, post-operative uh, PRO scores, Harris HIP, HOS, and AHS. Um, and uh, as well as VAS. A um, couple, two or three patients had to get revised, but these are very active patients, had traumatic um, type injuries afterwards and, and have symptoms of instability afterwards. Um, they are revised with another uh, scope for plantation that did well after that. So I'll just finish up uh, real fast with that. So it, as Dr. Dell mentioned, I just kind of got started and um, luckily I did do a fellowship because my second case in private practice was a 19 year old female anterior hip pain for about a year. She had snapping, uh, refractory conservative management, so my partners teed her up for me to come back to LA and, and do, a, do some hip arthroscopy. Uh, she's a water polo player, very active, aggressive type girl. Um, she's in school in New York City, but lived in Pasadena, so she's in town for the summer. Um, you can see this is her done view, a very small cam, if any. Um, uh, she had a crossover, I'll show on the next slide, that it corrected. Um, and I can't, I couldn't do a pulse profile uh, in the normal house here, but it was essentially normal. So here she is the, on the left, the supine, and on the right, the standing. So she corrects, I uh, didn't do any rim trimming on her. She was evaluated by another surgeon in town who uh, recommended uh, doing her pincer lesion. Uh, we can argue about that, whether she did need it or not, but I, I didn't feel that that was her problem. Um, she did have ligament and laxity, so Intraoperatively, she had a very small labrum. I call it about three millimeters. Uh, there was a sulcus almost all the way around. Uh, it didn't seem like there was a lot of damage, so I didn't uh, felt, feel there was a, a significant tear, um, and there was no chondral injury. So we did the, a little zapping of the labrum with a, a radio frequency type device. Uh, very small femoroplasty, uh, just to not just to not leave any stones unturned. Nail of release and uh, capsular plantation. So then she, she was going to New York to follow up, and I called a colleague and said, can you do me a favor, just see this patient at six weeks, there's nothing to do, just I want to give her somebody to feel confident when she can go back to New York and, and feel safe. And he calls me afterwards and says, what, I mean, what did you do? And he does, he dabbles in hip arthroscopy. He says, what did you do? And I said, well, she was more of an instability type case. Oh, I don't believe in instability, and I don't brace my patients. So uh, two lessons, there still is a, uh, uh, awareness of hip instability all in all, and also um, be careful who you send your patients to for your follow-up. <laughs> so in conclusion, um, instability of the hip does exist. It might be seeing you, but you might not be seeing it. Um, can you use soft tissue procedures to treat severe bony deformity? So if they do have severe dysplasia, get them to a PAO surgeon or do a, do a PAO. Um, and we've shown the capsular application can be a successful treatment in, in 